learn about synapse. Synapse is the junction between two neurons. Now let's look at the classification of synapse. We have an anatomical classification and functional classification. First let's look at the anatomical classification. Depending upon the ending of the axon, the synapse is classified into three types. Axoaxonic synapse, axodendritic synapse and axosomatic synapse. Axoaxonic synapse is one in which the axon of one neuron terminates on axon of the other neuron. That is we had learned about the structure of the neuron earlier in the first video. According to that in this type of anatomical classification of synapse in axoaxonic synapse the axon of one neuron terminates on axon of another neuron. In axodendritic synapse the axon of one neuron terminates on dendrite of another neuron. In axosomatic synapse, axon of one neuron ends on soma or the cell body of another neuron. Moving on to the functional classification, the functional classification of synapse is on the basis of mode of impulse transmission. According to this, synapse is classified into two categories. One is electrical synapse and second is chemical synapse. Now let's look at electrical synapse. Electrical synapse is one in which the physiological continuity between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons is provided by gap junctions. For example, if this is one neuron, this is another neuron, the space between it is, it is called, the junction between it is called the synapse. So bet before the synapse is presynaptic and after the synapse is postsynaptic. So, electrical synapse is one in which the physiological continuity between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron is provided by gap junctions between the two neurons. This type of impulse transmission is seen in tissues like cardiac muscles, smooth muscle fibers of intestine and epithelial cells of the lens of the eye. Now, let us look at chemical synapse. It is a junction between a nerve fiber and a muscle fiber or between two nerve fibers through which the signals are transmitted by the release of a chemical transmitter. In a chemical synapse, there is no continuity between two neurons because of the presence of a space called the synaptic cleft between two neurons. In electrical synapse, there was gap junctions, but here in chemical synapse, the space is called the synaptic cleft and there is no continuity between the two neurons because of this synaptic cleft. So we learned about classification. We have an anatomical classification and a functional classification. Under anatomical classification, we have three types that is axoaxonic synapse, axodendritic and axosomatic synapse. Under functional classification, we have electrical synapse and chemical synapse. Now let's learn about the functional anatomy of chemical synapse. Neurons from which the axon arises is called the presynaptic neuron and the neuron on which the axon terminates is called the postsynaptic neuron. The axon of the presynaptic neuron divides into many small branches before forming the synapse. These branches are known as the axon terminals. Now there are two types of axon terminals that is first is terminal knobs concerned with excitatory function of the synapse. Second type of axon terminal is terminal coils or free endings. They are concerned with inhibitory function. Now let's look at the synaptic cleft and the postsynaptic membrane. We know that in chemical synapse the space is known as the synaptic cleft. So let's look at the structure of the synaptic cleft and the postsynaptic membrane. Now the postsynaptic membrane contains receptor potentials. Small spaces in between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic membrane is called the synaptic cleft. Now here in my note I have drawn a diagram to show the structure that is a functional anatomy of chemical synapse. Now we learned about the functional anatomy of the chemical synapse where we learned about the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic, the synaptic cleft and its structure. Now let's move on to the functions of synapse. The main function of synapse is to transmit the impulses that is action potential from one neuron to the other. On the basis of functions, synapses are divided into two types. First is excitatory synapses which transmit the impulses. 
and second is inhibitory synapses which inhibit the transmission. Now let us look at the excitatory function. Now we will be learning about excitatory postsynaptic potential inside the excitatory function of the synapse. Now I have this table that I have drawn right here a flow chart which I will be explaining you all. Now excitatory postsynaptic potential, you know what is postsynaptic, it comes after the synapse, this is a presynaptic postsynaptic, here is a synapse. Now excitatory postsynaptic potential is a non-propagated electrical potential that develops during the process of synaptic transmission. It is a non-propagated electrical potential that develops during synaptic transmission when synapse takes place it is a potential that develops. Now, how does that happen? Let us see. There is arrival of action potential in axon terminal. If this is the axon, there is arrival of action potential in axon terminal. Now, there is once the arrival of action potential takes place, there is opening of the calcium channels in the presynaptic membrane. Before the synapse, in the presynaptic membrane, there is opening of calcium channels. Then after opening, there is influx of calcium channels from the extracellular fluid into the axon terminal. There, after the influx takes place, there is opening of vesicles and release of acetylcholine. Now this acetylcholine passes into the synaptic cleft, the cleft that is the space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic membrane, there is a synaptic cleft. So this acetylcholine passes through the synaptic cleft. Now once it passes through the synaptic cleft, there is formation of acetylcholine receptor complex. These uh, acetylcholine and receptors that is after the synapse takes place, there forms a complex which is called the acetylcholine receptor complex. Now after the formation of acetylcholine receptor complex, there is opening of sodium channels and influx of sodium ions from extracellular fluid. Remember earlier it was opening of calcium channels. Now it is the opening of sodium channels. Opening of sodium channels and influx of sodium ions. After the influx of sodium ions takes place, there is development of excitatory postsynaptic potential. Here is where EPSP takes place. Now after the development of excitatory postsynaptic potential, there is opening of sodium channels in initial segment of the axon and there is influx of sodium ions from the extracellular fluid and development of action potential. Now there is spread of this action potential through the axon of the postsynaptic neuron that is after the synapse the postsynaptic neuron. In this note I have shown the processes that takes place for the development of uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential the one in the presynaptic neuron and one in the postsynaptic neuron and here is the processes that takes place that I have explained you right now. We learned about the excitatory function, now we will move on to the inhibitory function of the synapse. Inhibition of synaptic transmission is classified into five types. First is postsynaptic or direct inhibition, second presynaptic or indirect inhibition, third is negative feedback or Renshaw cell inhibition, fourth is feed forward inhibition and fifth is reciprocal inhibition. Now let us look at the first one in detail that is postsynaptic or direct inhibition. Now the postsynaptic inhibition is the type of synaptic inhibition that occurs due to the release of an inhibitory neurotransmitter from the presynaptic terminal inside instead of an excitatory neurotransmitter substance. Now in the earlier one we had learned that there is release of acetylcholine that is an excitatory neurotransmitter. But in this case in postsynaptic or direct inhibition there is release of inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this is called direct inhibition. The inhibitory neurotransmitters are gamma aminobutric acid that is short form is GABA and dopamine and glycine. These are the examples of inhibitory neurotransmitters. Now let us look at the action of GABA that is development of inhibitory postsynaptic potential. In excitatory function we had learned about the excitatory postsynaptic potential, here we will be learning about the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. 
Now, the inhibitory postsynaptic potential is the electrical potential in the form of hyperpolarization that develops during postsynaptic inhibition. Now, let's look at it. I have lit, written it in a tabular that is uh, flow chart. So, let's look at it. Arrival of action potential in the axon terminal. Arrival of action potential in the axon terminal. Opening of calcium channels in the presynaptic membrane. Influx of calcium ions, just as we had learned earlier, influx of calcium ions from extracellular fluid into axon terminal. Now, once the calcium ions are uh, come inside, there is opening of vesicles and release of GABA. In the excitatory function, there was release of acetylcholine, but here, since it is inhibitory, there is release of inhibitory neurotransmitter that is GABA. Now, passage, passage of GABA into the synaptic cleft. Similar as the uh, one we had learned earlier, here there is passage of GABA into the synaptic cleft. There is formation of GABA receptor complex. And there is after this, there is opening of potassium channels and efflux of potassium into extracellular fluid. There is movement of potassium outside into the extracellular fluid. There is opening of chloride channels and influx of chloride into the neuron. Due to this, there is hyperpolarization and finally inhibition of synaptic transmission. So, once again let me tell you, when there is passage of GABA into the synaptic cleft, after that there is formation of GABA and GABA receptor complex. Now, after that there is opening of potassium channels and efflux of potassium into the extracellular fluid. Similarly, at the same time there is opening of chloride ions and influx of chlorine, chloride ions into the neuron. So, due to this process, there is hyperpolarization and there is inhibition of synaptic transmission. Now, under inhibitory function, let us move on to the second type that is presynaptic or indirect inhibition. Earlier, we had studied postsynaptic or direct inhibition. Now, we are studying presynaptic or indirect inhibition. Now, the presynaptic inhibition occurs due to the failure of the presynaptic axon terminal to release sufficient quantity of excitatory neurotransmitter substance. Now, here there is inhibition because the presynaptic axon terminal is not able to release enough excitatory neurotransmitter, for example, acetylcholine. It is also called indirect inhibition. It is mediated by axoaxonic synapses. We had learned it is one of the types of synapses, axoaxonic synapse. So, this type of inhibition that is indirect inhibition is mediated by axoaxonic synapse. It is prominent in spinal cord. It can be seen prominently in the spinal cord. Normally, during synaptic transmission, action potential reaching the presynaptic neuron produces development of excitatory postsynaptic potential in postsynaptic neuron. We had learned about excitatory postsynaptic potential in the excitatory function of the synapse. So, Normally during synaptic transmission, action potential uh, reaches the presynaptic neuron and it produces ES, EPSP that is excitatory postsynaptic potential in the postsynaptic neuron. But in spinal cord, a modulatory neuron which is called the presynaptic inhibitory neuron forms an axoaxonic synapse with the presynaptic neuron. As you can see, this red color is the presynaptic inhibitory neuron that forms an axoaxonic synapse with the presynaptic neuron and this is the postsynaptic neuron. Now, we learnt about postsynaptic or direct inhibition where there were release of inhibitory neurotransmitters called GABA that was a process. In second, we learned about presynaptic or indirect inhibition where there is not enough release of excitatory neurotransmitters. And there is axoaxonic synapse between the presynaptic inhibitory neuron and the presynaptic neuron. So, this was the basic thing about the first two functions, inhibitory functions. Now, let us move on to the third point under inhibitory function of synapse. That is Renshaw cell inhibition or negative feedback inhibition. The negative feedback inhibition is the type of synaptic inhibition which is caused by Renshaw cells in the spinal cord. When motor neurons send motor impulses, some of the impulses reach the Renshaw cell by passing through collaterals. Now, the Renshaw cell is stimulated. In turn, it sends the inhibitory impulses to alpha motor neurons so that the discharge from the motor neurons is reduced. 
As you can see in this diagram, alpha motor neuron sends impulses. Some of them reaches the Renshaw cells through collaterals. The Renshaw cell is inhibited. It sends inhibitory impulses to the motor neuron so that further discharge is stopped. Now, the fourth point under inhibitory function is feed forward inhibition. Feed forward synaptic inhibition occurs in cerebellum and it controls neuronal activity in cerebellum. During the process of neuronal activity in cerebellum, stellate cells and basket cells which are activated by granule cells inhibit the Purkinje cells by releasing GABA. This type of inhibition is called feed forward inhibition. Now the fifth that is the last point under inhibitory function of synapse is reciprocal inhibition. Inhibition of antagonistic muscles when a group of muscles are activated is called reciprocal inhibition. For example, when we lift an object, the flexor muscles are activated while the extensor muscles are inhibited. This is called the reciprocal inhibition. Now, what is the significance of synaptic inhibition? It limits the number of impulses going to the muscles and enables the muscles to act properly and appropriately. Second point is that it helps to select the exact number of impulses and omit or block the excess ones. Next, let's look at the properties of synapse. We have five properties. First is one-way conduction which is called Belmajandi's law. Second is synaptic delay. Third is fatigue. Fourth is summation and fifth is electrical property. First, let's look at one-way conduction. Now, according to the Belmajandi's law, the impulses are transmitted only in one direction that is from presynaptic neuron to postsynaptic neuron. Second is synaptic delay. The short delay that occurs during the transmission of impulses through the synapse is called synaptic delay. It is due to the time taken for the release of neurotransmitter. Second, its passage from axon terminal to postsynaptic knob. Third, action of neurotransmitter to open the ionic channels in the postsynaptic membrane. Third point is fatigue. During continuous muscular activity, synapse becomes the seat of fatigue along with the bed cells present in the motor area of the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex. Fatigue at the synapse is due to the depletion of neurotransmitter substance acetylcholine. And the fourth point is summation. It is the fusion of effects or progressive increase in the excitatory postsynaptic potential in the postsynaptic neuron. We have already learned about excitatory postsynaptic potential earlier. When many presynaptic excitatory terminals are stimulated simultaneously or when a single presynaptic neuron or presynaptic terminal is stimulated repeatedly, many excitatory postsynaptic potentials develop repeatedly one after the other. It is of two types, spatial and temporal summation. The final property of synapse is electrical properties. I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you so much for watching.